We are live on Facebook with Ann and Joe Scheidler of the Pro-Life Action League. I am Eric Scheidler, Executive Director of the Pro-Life Action League. And we are thrilled to be with you to share an update on uh, how my dad's doing. As those of you who've been following on Facebook know, he has been uh, in and out of the hospital a little bit lately with uh, some issues. And um, I got to mute that. All righty. So <laughs> just uh, getting uh, things all squared away here. Thanks for folks who have already joined us. Uh, bear with me as I do some sharing on social media. The entire world has become one big Zoom chat room. Oh, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, there was a one of my favorite TV shows was called Zoom, and I still oh, think I of remember that, that theme song. <laughs> you know, come you on, know. Zoom, 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 on Zoom, Zoom, a Zoom, a Zoom, a Zoom, Zoom. Um, that was back in the days before the two-letter state abbreviations, and I'll never forget the box three five zero Boston Mass. Oh, Boston one, Mass three four. Some of you guys will remember that. Send it to Zoom. So we are live on Facebook, and um, oh, we've got a, an audience building up here. Um, Good. Sandra Church is here, and several others. Uh, I'm just checking to see if I can see who's here with us. Still kind of learning the ropes here of, of Facebook Live, as so many of us are. Well, let's jump right into it. Um, so, Dad, you've um, you've been in and out of the hospital a few times in recent weeks, and you know we've let people know about that on uh, on Facebook, asking for their prayers. And, um, and the outpouring has just been amazing. I mean, tens of thousands of people have been commenting and sharing, their, sharing that, those posts and, and praying and asking others to pray. So why don't you give us a quick update? Just tell us kind of how it all began and the ins and out of it and let everybody know how you're doing right now. Well, first of all, I'm very touched by the response to just going to the hospital. I mean, people have been wonderful. They called, they sent cards, and um, I've had long talks with them. And uh, the thing is, I don't go to the hospital as much. I hate hospitals. But I was having some digestive problems. I thought it went on for a year and a half. And I thought, why don't I just check this out? Well, it was some kind of a problem. The doctors didn't think it was very serious. But I wanted to have a, a, a better uh, lifestyle. So I asked if they could do this. Mine is a minor seminary, in and out. And um, I went in for that. And in the process, they discovered that I actually had a, uh, a hernia. Now my dad had hernias, and I wasn't sure what a hernia was, but they, heck, feel like the dickens. They really hurt, and this hernia was bigger and bigger. It, you had, it's the intestines coming out into the free world. So it's anyway, the, world. <laughs> so the no. doctor pushed him back in, and almost killed me, the pain was so awful. And they all came out again. So he said, we just have to patch this up. So they went in, and they pushed the, the, the intestines back where they're supposed to be. And then they put a kind of a mesh over it and, and sewed that down. So I'm back to normal, uh, pretty much. But the process, in the, in the process, um, you know, I had to be in the hospital and trying to uh, meet people and all this. And um, I, I went through, a, the, the way had, had gave me different tests. I did that um, make, um, scan where they put your whole body through a tube. Right, and I, right, I'm right. claustrophobic, and I thought I'd go nuts. So they gave me a little powder, and I went nuts. <laughs> I thought I was on a hayride. He came back from the MRI saying he'd been on a hayride. hayride. I don't know. think so. <laughs> I I've had an MRI, and it, was, it didn't feel like a hayride to me at all. It felt like being sitting <laughs> in outer space. World. Different yeah. colors, different people, different languages. Anyway, I got out of that, and I couldn't get wait, wait to get out of the hospital. But then they had had the COVID nineteen test. Twice. Yeah, I wanted to ask, how many COVID tests did you have all together? You were in the I hospital. Had two. You had two different visits to the hospital, right? Yeah. Is that right? And so two tests. That's the most important thing in the world. Actually, you had but, three when it comes right down to it. Oh, that's right. Because yeah. they did one prior to the original yeah. outpatient procedure, um, 
and, th and then when they had to do this emergency hernia surgery, they had to do another one. And, you know, all these rules and things about COVID make absolutely no sense at all. So we're sitting in the emergency room at Resurrection Hospital. Nurses and doctors are in and out, everybody, you know, and they're all wearing masks, of course, ordinary masks. And then the nurse comes in in, in a sort of gas mask, outer space outfit with the COVID test. And she's got to give him a, a quick test and a longer test. Uh -huh. So, uh, and he said, well, now what happens if I have it? Well, it doesn't make any difference. They're going to do the surgery anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But um, any event, she says, technically, um, I have to ask you to leave, me, to leave after we do the test. I'm like, well, that, why is that? I mean, I, I've been here all morning. Here and I actually live with this man and, um, you know, he's going to go home with me later too. But that's the rule. She said, well, you know, everybody's watching. So, you know, you have to do it. So I left. So then I couldn't come back until um, he was out of recovery. You're not allowed to wait in the hospital building during um, surgery. The waiting rooms are closed and stuff. And they, they send you these little text updates. Well, at least they're supposed to. They didn't actually do that this time. But um, so I wanted, after the whole thing was over, um, I wanted to get him his phone but he wasn't assigned to a regular room. He was you know, in between recovery room and a regular room. And visiting hours are strictly 12 to six because COVID never attacks after six, or before six o'clock. It's only you know, after six o'clock so, <laughs> or prior to noon. And, and um, luckily they know this and they're able to schedule the visits at a safe time. So they weren't gonna let me in. And I, I, um, I said to the, the guard at the desk, who was a very nice man, uh, I, I need to get this phone to him. Well, the people at the desk aren't allowed to go up to the floors to deliver anything. So someone has to send a nurse down. And we didn't have a package to put the phone in. So he stuck it in a rubber glove and put Joe's name on it. And someone came down and got it and brought it to him. So the next day, you know, he's able to reach people. But now he doesn't have a phone charger because we didn't have that with us. And um, so I, I went to take the charger to the hospital. And when I and so did our uh, my son Joe, he he has an office closer to the um, to the hospital, so he headed over with a charger also. And in both cases, the guy at the counter didn't check the computer to see that the COVID test, the long COVID test, had not come back yet. So no one was allowed. He was in quarantine, in isolation. Mm -hmm. So we d we did not run into each other on the way but he got to the room first and the nurses all panicked still in their space suits you mm -hmm. know because of, of the isolation oh you can't be here you can't be here you know you have to kind of wave from the hallway and pass the phone cord in and then i show up right after they kick him out and ma'am ma'am you can't be here you can't be here. I, said, I said truly i mean he's going home with me if he's got it you know <laughs> i'm not <laughs> Yeah. I can't sit up. I can't sit up. I try to get out. Bells go off. Alarm rings. It's an interesting experience. To go to the hospital again. <laughs> it's a strange thing with those tests. You know, the I've been reading up on that a little bit, and uh, even uh, NPR, which is not uh, you know, Infowars or anything, is reporting that uh, the COVID tests, the PCR long, the longer term COVID tests are, are far, far, far too sensitive. They're yeah, I guess so. picking up, yeah. you know, a factor of cases more than they would if um, if the rapid if we simply relied on the rapid tests, which aren't quite as accurate, but are way less likely to give you a false positive of like there's some viral tissue here, but not enough to ever make a person sick or to ever cause them uh -huh. to infect someone else. So without getting into yeah. all of that, um, uh, we well, are fortunately that was like about three o'clock on Friday and um, at five o'clock or 10 minutes to five, he got the all clear and out of isolation. So we live relatively close to the hospital. So I raced back over there and got about a 45 minute visit in. That's nice. <laughs> so that wasn't the only thing you were busy with during uh, the time that uh, dad was in the hospital. No, um, no. You had the chance to attend a five year anniversary of some significance. I did. So when I left the hospital on Friday evening, I went over to the Kananaya Center, which is a Indian Catholic um, 
uh, community center on the northwest side of Chicago, they're, they're across the street from the building that for uh, a good 20, 25 years was a late-term abortion clinic. And we had spent countless hours, thousands of hours, praying and counseling outside of this clinic until uh, five years ago on um, a day in October, whatever that, mm. Friday 18th maybe it was, or no, no maybe, maybe it was the 16th. October 16th, 17th, that's all. Yeah. Okay, it, so th that closed, five years ago, that clinic closed and it's been kind of up in the air whether it was going to be reopened. Um, they, they had violated all kinds of zoning uh, regulations and they decided it was too expensive to try to meet the code oh, and yeah, so they moved they, out. Their generators weren't functional and, and if a woman was on anesthesia during an abortion procedure she could literally d die from the power. Oh, yeah so and they, they had their their um, in excess, uh, access and egress etc for um, yeah. the um, clinic staff areas, was all area. wrong. Um, so anyway they did shut down largely due to the research of Jean Croco the pro-life action league uh, investigator. Uh, yeah. Investigator, yes, yes. So um, that was a huge victory. So five years ago, so there was a mass in the parking lot um, of this Kananaya Center across the street. They have been so cooperative over the years um, with with uh, wow. uh, letting us have um, mass vigils and, and prayer meetings, and people park on their parking lot to, and we did a lot of counseling from their parking lot and in their parking lot over the years. So um, yeah, this was a, a wonderful occasion. And the building has been bought, or at least leased, by um, the Chicago Eye Institute. And now it's, I mean, it used to be such a gloomy looking, such a gloomy place. It had a huge tall a chain link fence with canvas tarp all the way around. Yeah. All of the, the windows were shuttered. There was you, even the front door didn't open. Yeah, I mean, it was just such a shabby, shabby looking place. And now it's bright and beautiful. Uh, the windows are open, lights are on in there, and um, the, the parking lot is surrounded by a nice wrought iron fence and landscaping, and such an improvement to the neighborhood. It it, it was just it it just made me you know uh, feel so good to drive up there and see. I look forward to seeing one of those changes myself in, in the future. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just to, because some more people have joined this uh, conversation since we started, and um, before we move on to a couple of other things, I uh, just want to clarify. So, Dad, you're you're feeling pretty good these days. I'm feeling good. I had one problem last Sunday. I was where the boys were having we were having a nice little talk, <clears throat> and I got up very quickly to put something on the counter. And lost my balance, and it just ha happened. I fell into a tea, this tea uh, table, and it it broke four ribs in my back. Oh my goodness! Now you can't do with anything with broken ribs, but I went out to have X-ray just to see what it looks like, and there are four very broken ribs, broken <laughs> off, and it's a, it's painful. If you have broken ribs, it's it's a sharp pain. So uh, that's the only thing now that's sort of holding me from running around and making more of a uh, bother myself is these broken ribs. They, they really have to kind of take it easy. But other than that, I'm going to health. My heart's good. My lungs are That's great. That's great. I'm losing my mind, but other than that, you know, <laughs> that just happens when you get old and you get lame. Well, I think COVID times have pushed us all in that direction a little yeah bit. well people will be very <laughs> glad to hear that and we uh we appreciate again all the prayers and um you just really encourage people to keep praying for the ribs to heal up and for the pain to be alleviated and for uh you know for everything to uh to return to normal i want to acknowledge some of the folks who are um we're chiming in we've heard from debbie fisher she says it's great to see you guys oh, yeah. well, uh, okay. debbie fisher worked on the now be our favorite lawyer <laughs> yeah <laughs> Nancy Evan, <laughs> Nancy Evan, Leroy Pia, Sandy Sandra Church, and, and quite a few others are watching as well. And we're going to be sharing this with, uh, with, with our friends and supporters across the country uh, as well. But uh, I thought maybe we could kind of turn because, you know, you know, so many people were really concerned about hearing that you were having some health issues, um, you know, because you're, 
I hate to call you an old man, but I just don't know how to get away with saying an 93. 93. Yeah, that, 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 I think that, uh, that kind of qualifies, I'm afraid. Oh, <laughs> but at 93, uh, you know, you have a lot of perspective. Um, we did the math, and this is like your 18th or 19th presidential election, uh, going back to 1948, huh? Dewey, yeah. Campaign yeah. for Thomas Dewey. Um, so here we are on the verge of, of another election. What's your message for the pro-life voters out there? Well, Trump has to win. If Trump doesn't win and Biden gets in, we go into total socialism. Things are really, really bad. And I'm just hoping there are enough people uh, hanging around who won't admit that they're Trump uh, lovers. I don't love Trump, but I admire what he's done. And he's been probably one of the most effective presidents the pro-life movement can have. And that a genuine citizens that believe in democracy and the Constitution and so on. Uh, Trump is our guy. There's no question about it. He's, he, he doesn't take advantage of, of many opportunities. Maybe he will in debates tonight. But at any rate, anyway, I, I do see, I'm just, just maybe just I'm not a good prognosticator, but I, I think Trump will win. If Trump wins, we will go on. We will have a Supreme Court that is very heavily conservative. We will clean up some of the mess that the Democrats have made. And um, also, I think our economy will get back. The COVID thing is going to drop off one of these days. It, it's, it's been overdone. It's been wrongly handled. Um, it's, it's just been a, a, a great big catastrophe. But we can pull out of it somehow. And these will never be quite the same, at least for many, many years. But I'm, I'm uh, hope, I hope in the debate tonight that Trump lets Biden talk, lets people see that he really has a very real problem as a leader. Talk about losing his mind. Losing his mind you know. and no, we joke around about here, but Biden really has displayed some uh, significant Biden is off his rock. deterioration. I, you know, we've all seen you know, all the people. One that, of the things you know, um, um, that I did while uh, Joe was recuperating in between before he had the broken rib thing, um, I attended a, an event um, here in Chicago for uh, Black Voices for Trump. Oh, wow. And um, these, these folks were just outspokenly pro-Trump. They weren't even trying to say, oh, I don't like his tweets or, oh, I don't like his character. <laughs> or, it was just boldly that he is the best thing that's happened to the Black community in, you know, in forever, practically, since Abraham Lincoln. And they were so... Uh, unabashedly, uh, you know, firm about this and telling telling the folks who were there, um, be bold about your support for Trump. So I came home and I, I had a Trump sign that I was a little hesitant to put in my yard since I live in Chicago. But, you know, bolstered by um, Patricia Easley, particularly, who had led the, this um, Black Latin Voices for Trump event, I put my Trump sign in the yard. And it actually lasted for about two weeks. It's disappeared. Now. Well, we know. <laughs> but the first time, uh, well, the about a couple days after I put that sign out there, I was out in my yard watering some flowers, and a girl walked by, a young girl walked by with her dog, and she looked at the sign and looked at me and said, I'm pro-choice. And I said, gee, I'm really sorry to hear that. <laughs> and she walked on. <laughs> it's interesting that she kind of grasped that that was the issue. Isn't you know? it? I have no idea who she was. I oh, never saw her before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was well, interesting. You know, we dance around it. We yeah. Pretend that, uh, you know, it, it's still an important, critical issue. I've rem remained convinced that President Trump was elected in the first place because pro life people decided to take a chance on this formerly pro choice, uh, you know, public figure. And um, we've, we've seen him come through on so much of what he said he was going to do. Yeah. Like it. You know, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been strange times because we've had people who, uh, you know, had a pro-life track record, but didn't do all they could. I mean, George W. Bush was generally pretty good for the movement, but he never stripped Planned Parenthood of Title X funding, decided no. it wasn't oh. uh, politically expedient. Trump said, let's do it. Yeah. Well, Trump had just yeah. spoken out. I mean, he is pro-life. There's no question about that. He believes the same thing we believe, which is the truth. And he's acting on it. His talk and he's not much. afraid to say so no. in his in his campaign things and in, in his State of the Union address. 
I mean, he doesn't couch it in a whole lot of vague language, so it wouldn't sound extreme or something. He just well, there was, it. you know, I was there um, last year. At, I was fortunate enough to be in the VIP area when he spoke at the March for Life, and it it was uh, it was kind of shocking to think that we never had uh, Ronald Reagan, we never had George Bush, we never had George W. Bush ever come and speak to the March for Life. They would send a message, they would send a video, they'd send an yeah. emissary. Yeah. You know, they just kind of didn't want to get themselves dirty with it in some way. And Trump just came. Yeah. He just came he and just came. Came came to to walk right on in. That was amazing. And when you figure oh. the logistics of him going anywhere, that's a big deal too. Yeah. It was wild with all the... It was a highlight in my pro-life movement. Yeah. You know, the President of the United States come to one of our rallies and talk like a real pro-life or better than most of the other legislators. He talked about God, he talked about Jesus, he talked about the baby, talked about killing, right there in front of everybody. But that took guts. And that's yeah, what so I it's, um, it, it's, been, it's been an adventure because a lot of us were, you know, I was one who was taking, I, I thought I was rolling the dice. I mean, I was, I, I, I was rolling the dice with Trump and um, I feel like from the pro-life perspective, uh, it was worth it. And, um, and on the flip side of that, there's the, you know, the, the Biden Harris ticket could be disastrous. Oh, and not, you know, not one of the things that I always concerned about, and this is, you know, you have a long history with this. It's not just about Roe v. Wade. It's not just about abortion restrictions that we might be able to enact and save some lives. It's about the rights that we as pro-life activists, as pro-life people have. Yeah. In your case, now V. Scheidler went before the Supreme Court. The courts are often deciding whether or not we're allowed to speak our mind. Uh, yeah. And actually, our, our lawyer, you know, Tom Brecca, was always convinced that the reason our case finally did, in fact, go to trial instead of being dismissed was because Bill Clinton was the president and ordered the Justice Department to go after us. So, you know, elections have consequences, as they say. Yeah, they really you know? do. Um, they really and do. And, you know, uh, there's, uh, there's such a move to, to try to squelch the... the um, the freedoms of conservatives and pro-lifers and religious people, um, we could be in danger if if the Democrats take over. Big danger. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I'd love to uh, think that a Catholic president, if you know, if Biden were to win, would be um, an advantage to us. But unfortunately, too many of our Catholic legislators have abandoned their faith, and they only use it to try to get votes from other people who are Catholic and a either aren't serious about their faith or not paying very much attention to what the, the issues really are. But, um, you know, they're, they support everything that's, that's diametrically opposed to our beliefs. Well, you know, Joe Biden uh, needs our prayers too. And then maybe he we does. can invite he does. all those who've been voting for Joe Scheidler to also vote to, to pray, I should say, pray for Joe <laughs> Scheidler to, yeah. uh, that would be another story. To also yeah, pray don't vote for, for Joe. Vote. <laughs> Just pray for Joe. For you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. To go ahead and pray, pray for Joe Biden too, you know, because um, he, he needs it. Clearly, he's had his head sort of turned on some of these issues, and yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I only recently learned that he used to be pro-life. That he had been he uh, oh, yeah. voted for the Hatch Amendment back in the early 1980s, like so many. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame. It is. Well, and lots you of things happen in the course of a. Uh, someone's political career or pro-life activism career. And uh, I guess just on behalf of everybody watching and those who are gonna watch later and all those who've been sending their well wishes and prayers, uh, it's very gratifying to all of us in the pro-life movement to know that we have Joe Scheidler there to give us perspective and to, uh, to bring the, those many decades of experience on the front lines of this movement uh, into these new battles in 2020 and pandemic times and on into to 2021. So, uh, Dad, I'm, I'm so glad that you're feeling better and uh, oh, yeah. and that you're you know getting the care that you need. And um, you know, just uh, any any final words for all the folks watching as we uh, as we sign off and and um, get back to work uh, here on the front lines. Well, what I what I'm finding and experiencing so much now is a great love within the movement. Uh, it's true, we love life, we love our country, we love our church, and we love Christ and all that, but we also love one another. And this is something that's coming very, I mean, the people that call me, or the people that I call to thank for money, and they answer back, 
are, are just so genuine friends. They care about you. They're praying for you. And you know they are. You know when they say, I'm praying a rosary for you every day, you know they're doing that. Yeah. And that's a gift, to give spiritual gifts to one another, because ultimately it runs, ends up in a spiritual realm. We're in the world today with all kinds of messy things happening and, and, and people being debased and, and lied to and everything. But ultimately it comes out to truth, to finding the truth, living the truth, and ultimately being with the truth forever. Well, that's a great way to, to land this conversation um, with uh, the, big, the biggest of, pos of all possible perspectives. So thank you for sharing that. And um, if, if anybody watching would like to hear more about the story of Joe Scheidler and his, his battles on the front line, you can, uh, you can find that on, I'm looking for my copy. I'm not seeing it right in front of me, but Racketeer for Life, somewhere here on my desk. Uh, your memoir, Racketeer for Life, is available from the Pro-Life Action League. Uh, we'll send people a signed copy if they put in an order for that. Uh, I have a copy. I can oh, grab it. Uh, show it to us. Uh, yeah. yeah. We read it all the time. <laughs> oh. There it is. Racketeer for Life. Racketeer for Life. Joe uh, loves to sign. He'd love to sign a copy for you. Right, from the, from the Supreme free. Court to the sidewalk. Yeah. Yeah. So you can check that out at uh, prolifeaction.org and, um, and, and learn more about this legacy that uh, we continue to benefit from. Mom and Dad, thanks for taking the time to chat with me and, and with everybody else out there in the world. And um, shout out to all been watching. Uh, Les Leslie Hazinski's uh, joined us and uh, quite a few folks are, are sending their good wishes. So yeah, here are some more. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Like uh, I don't, I've only got a few names here because we're we're on our Zoom channel um, rather than Facebook, but we've got a bunch of folks yeah. watching and, and we'll be sharing this with more uh, over the course we of the We love time. you all. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll, we'll come back with another one of these chats uh, one day real soon. So stay tuned. Yeah, everybody. this is fun. Okay. Right. okay. Thanks, folks. Bye -bye. We'll see you soon.